All right, Matthew chapter 8, we're going to jump right into the passage here. If you look down in your Bibles there, verse number 1. The Bible says, When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And if you remember, if you've been following along, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are all, it's known as the Sermon on the Mount. He was up in a mountain and he was preaching and they all go together. So like all three chapters, it's just a continuation of Jesus Christ teaching and preaching. So now that that's finished, he comes down from the mountain and it says great multitudes followed him. So he had that great sermon. He's teaching the truth. And I think it's pretty encouraging because a lot of the stuff that he preached when we went over it, you know, some of that stuff was hard preaching. He's talking about, hey, you've heard it was like this, but now I'm telling you this. And he made things, you know, even stronger. Yet the people still loved it because a lot, you know, what you're going to find is that people who are interested in the truth love to hear the truth. Whether, whether it's hard to hear, hard to understand or not, when you hear something, you know, you know what? That's right. You know what? I shouldn't be looking at a woman and lusting her after her in my heart. You know, that is right. Whether you're guilty or not, you say, you know what? That's true. And I want to I wanna hear that and I want to follow that. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why we, you know, I try to preach the way I preach. And, you know, the churches that I've always attended and, and have wanted to go to are ones where I, wanna, I just want to hear the truth. I don't, I don't want to be, you know, have things watered down. I don't want people, you know, trying to package up a, a sermon that's not going to offend anybody because they're afraid to just say what's true. You know, I, I just want to hear what the truth is. Truth is, is truth. There's, there's no good or bad to it. It is what it is. It's, it's the truth. I mean, the truth is good. There's no bad to it at all. And... and I just want to hear the truth. And Jesus had a lot of people following him at this point because he was out there preaching the truth. And, and the Bible says that he, he preached it boldly too and as one that had authority. Yeah. Not like people who just, like the scribes, yeah. just like, well, this is what God's word says and we don't know, you know. No, he, he said this is the way it is. Thus saith the Lord as the way that, that God's word ought to be preached. Uh, let's keep reading in verse number two. The Bible says, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And I've mentioned this before, but we're going to see this all throughout the Gospel of Matthew and through all the Gospels, really. The, the cleansing and the healing that Jesus has, you know, does when he's on the earth and so many great illustrations of just our sin being cleansed and he says here you know this this leper comes to him and obviously leprosy the disease of leprosy is a very serious disease and it's something where people had to be you know away it was infectious and they would kind of have to live in a colony outside of the city and oftentimes people would just be lepers until their death just just lepers their entire life and it was a disease that was not easily handled. Now, uh, the scripture gives a lot of actually attention given to this disease on how to deal with it, how to treat it, and, and all these things. But we see this leper come to Jesus and he says, if thou will. Basically what that means is, if you want to, I know that you can, that you can cleanse me. And that's already just exhibiting the faith that this person had because he's saying, I believe that if you want it to happen, that you can, that you can heal me. So just with those three words, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, it's already demonstrating the faith that he has. And that's one thing you're going to notice uh, throughout the, the verses as well, that people, you know, every, virtually, I don't want to say every single time, but virtually every time people are being healed, it's, it's a result of faith. Because that's what's being taught is that when you go to, to the Lord with faith, when you go to Christ in faith, he heals you. He cleanses you. He saves you. He washes away your sins. And no matter how sinful you are, I mean, leprosy is a pretty bad plague to have. Yet, it says here, first of all, he will. He says, you know, I said, I will, which means he wants to. The Bible says the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants people to be saved. God wants people to be cleansed. God wants people to be pure. He says, I will. And he says, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And I love that. It's immediately. It's not this long process. It's not this full process of, well, 
okay, I want you to be cleansed, but first you've got to go to church, then you've got to do this, then you've got to do that, then you've got to read your Bible, then you've got to pray, then you've got to... And you know what? Maybe by the end of your life, you'll be completely cleansed. But if you're not, then you're going to go to this purgatory place where you're going to be burning in fire. Don't worry, it's not going to be as bad as hell, but you're, you're going to be purged. And then, may, then, you know, after long enough, you'll be cleansed and you can go to heaven. No, immediately. And this is just the way that salvation works. Amen. That the moment you call on the name of the Lord in faith right. is the moment that you are saved. You have your faith in Jesus Christ. That is when you're saved. It's immediate. And it's, and it's permanent. And it's forever. Um, and this is just one example of that, just through the healing of a person with leprosy, he's cleansed. But just, and just think about how amazing this is, too, for people who are around him, because this isn't a, a solitary event. Things like this are happening regularly with Jesus Christ. I mean, imagine seeing someone that you know to be diseased. Leprosy is a disease that's visible. It's not something that's just internal where like you may not know if someone has certain diseases because it's, it doesn't really have much of an outward representation of the, of the or outward symptoms of the disease. Leprosy does. It's outward in the flesh. I mean, you're going to see it. They're usually, you know, be walking around with something over their mouth. And, you know, and the Bible says they're supposed to be saying unclean, unclean, you know, and that they're identifying that they're a leper. And to see someone like that and have someone known in the area where you live, know this person, and then all of a sudden they go to Jesus Christ and boom, they're clean, they're healed. It's not something that happened over a week or, you know, it was, I just saw you this morning. And now they're completely healed. What, how amazing is that? Just to, just to see the reality of these things happening, Jesus was literally healing people on a regular basis when he was on this earth. Look at verse number four. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So basically he's saying now, because after a person is cleansed from leprosy, after they are healed, in the Old Testament it says that they're supposed to then go and offer a sacrifice, and go through the whole, you know, the law of Moses. And Jesus is telling them to do that because they're still under that, that old covenant. He hasn't died on the cross and rose again from the dead yet. So he's instructing him now, now that you're cleansed, hey, follow, follow the law. Do what, do what the Lord says that you're supposed to do. Now, a lot of these stories, we're not going to go back and look at um, all the other references, but these stories you're going to find in other Gospels. And what you're going to find is a lot more or just different information. So more information given in different Gospels. And we're going to look up a few of them, but we're not going to go to all of them just for sake of time. But it's, all, it's very interesting. I encourage you to do this if you haven't done this before. Just as a study, separate from just your Bible reading, but as a study, go through and, and compare all four Gospels. And the one that you're going to find that's the most different from the rest is going to be John. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke will have a much more overlap in, in you know, telling of the same stories. John has some too, but it's just not quite as much as, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. John is, is kind of a, almost like a standalone with just completely different information on, on other events and things like that. But go through because you'll get a, the full picture of all of these stories. And it doesn't mean that you know, none of them are contradictory to each other. They're complementary to each other. So where you have someone like Matthew giving his account of everything that happened when he was with Jesus Christ, everything he's saying is true, but he just doesn't give you all of the information. Whereas then you go to Mark and it's just, oh, okay, it's from Mark's perspective. He's, you know, watching all these events. He's with Jesus Christ during these events and he's recounting and, and giving his testimony, which oftentimes includes other details of what's happening simultaneously. So uh, that will kind of help you get the, the full picture when you read all the Gospels and, and kind of line them up. And you can, you can put them side by side. Their chapters are usually pretty close. Um, like we're going to turn to Luke chapter 7 here in just a minute. We're going to read, keep reading in Matthew chapter 8. But uh, the same story with this, uh, with this centurion is also recorded in Luke chapter 7. So we're going to, as soon as we read it here in Matthew 8, we'll flip over to Luke 7. Matthew 8, verse number 5, the Bible reads, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. 
And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And this is, I, I, this is a marvelous story. I think this is a great story. I love this, this story that's given to us here in the scripture for many reasons. I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from here and even more when we flip over and compare it with Luke chapter 7. But before we do that, one of the things that we see here is that this centurion has a lot of humility. He has a lot of respect for Jesus Christ. And he has a lot of faith. And when we're, we're going to see, again, we're going to see more. Let's just go ahead and look at Luke chapter 7. But basically, what he's doing is, he hears about Jesus Christ. He knows he's able to heal. He has a, it's not even him that's sick. He has a servant that's sick. His servant has the palsy. He's saying, man, you know, it's plaguing him. He, he's tormented by this disease. And he's beseeching Jesus to come and heal him. But what he says is that, he says, I want you to heal him. And Jesus says, okay, I'll come. He agrees to it. He says, I'll come and heal him. And he says, you don't even have to come. Because I know that you can just heal him without even having to come and lay a, lay a finger on him. And he likens it to him being a soldier. He's a centurion. A centurion means he's over 100 people. He's over 100 soldiers. And he's like, I know what it's like to have people under me. I tell this guy to go, and he goes. I tell this guy to do something, and he does it. How much more the Son of God? Right? So he's saying, I, I know that you could, you could just send someone, you could send an angel. And this is, you know, obviously I'm adding a little bit, but that's, that's basically what he's thinking. He's just thinking that you're able, you're a man under great, of great authority, you can just say the word, and it'll be done. Now, one of the things I think that is so great about this is it's, it's talking about a centurion. This is probably not a Jew. This is probably a Gentile being a centurion, being a soldier in the area. And the reason why I say that is it's not just because of a centurion, because Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, I have not found <coughs> so great faith, no, not in Israel. He's saying this guy has, gr like, look at the faith that he has. That he doesn't, he's saying, you don't even have to come to, to heal the servant. I haven't found anybody in Israel with that kind of faith, with that great of faith. And he's just giving a lot of regard for the centurion. And flip over to Luke chapter 7, we're going to see a little bit more about this guy too. And this is what I'm talking about, that this isn't contradictory. And I think there's another real interesting point here, is that we see from Matthew chapter 8, it appears as though Jesus is just talking directly to the centurion this whole time. I mean, that's, that's the way that you read it. But what's really cool about this is that Jesus isn't even speaking directly to the centurion. He actually has sent somebody else, which is further demonstrates his humility because he's saying that basically he's not even worthy to go out and talk to Jesus, let alone have him come into his house. So he does it by proxy and he's sending someone else. But what this is showing us is that these are the words of the centurion. So when Matthew 8 records that the, the centurion is saying, and then, it, and then it gives the quote, those are the centurion's words that he has instructed his servant to go out and say directly to Jesus Christ for him. This is the same reason why we can read the book of Matthew, which you could say, well, those are Matthew's words. No, but they're actually God's words. It's the word of the Lord. The, the Holy Bible is God's word. He's the author. There are different people who spake these words or wrote these words, but they're still God's words. And this is what's demonstrated here with the centurion. They're the centurion's words that he's giving to, to tell Jesus through his servant. But let's look at Luke chapter 7. The Bible reads, 
Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. So this is the same exact thing. Matthew 8, 5, it says, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum. So this is the same story. This is the same exact thing that's going on. He's entering into Capernaum. And a, a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. So he sends unto him, he doesn't come himself, he sends these elders to him. And it says in verse number four, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation and he hath built us a synagogue. So again, here's more evidence that this guy is not a Jew physically. He's not a Hebrew. Because they're saying, he, first of all, he sends Jews, he sends those elders probably because he realizes that Jesus came to his own. You remember when, uh, when the woman came to Jesus and she wanted to be healed, and he goes, you know, I'm not come but to the lost sheep of Israel. And, and, he, and he made the reference to the dogs, and she says, yeah, but the dogs eat of the crumbs under the table. I think she came to get her, da her daughter healed, and he says, you know, go thy way that your daughter's healed. And he said, for this saying, because she had that level of humility that even though Jesus Christ, yes, he came unto his own. Yes, he came unto the Jews. And when he went around and preached the gospel and everything, they hit Israel. They were hitting Judah. They were hitting just they didn't go off into the Gentile nations until after the resurrection of Christ, where he was sending them off. Now go ahead and preach the gospel to the whole world. But his ministry was just on the Jews. So this guy, it sounds like this centurion was, was a pretty godly person in general anyways, that, that he, he seemed to know a lot, he seemed to have a lot of humility, and he's even sending other people just to, I think, just to also get Jesus' attention because who's it, you say, who's this Gentile coming to me, right? So he sends these elders to go and speak to him. And they, they answer and say, well, uh, you know, this guy's worthy. And they're, they're explaining to Jesus, this is a good guy. And he says, he loves our nation. So, you know, again, that's what, if he was part of their nation, then why would they say, well, he loves our nation? Uh, and he hath built us a synagogue. So they're saying, you know, he's, he's, he's a wealthy guy, but he, he loves us. He loves the church. He, you know, he's, he's doing whatever he can to help. And, uh, and you should help him out. And it says in verse 6, then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. So he's coming, but he still doesn't even make it to his house. And he's saying, you know, I, who am I that you would come into my house? And he says in verse 7, Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. So immediately... The guy's healed. And Jesus didn't even have to go and physically touch him or do anything. And uh, that's just demonstrated by the faith. And again, this is a reason why, you know, we can pray having faith to God. He doesn't have to physically come down and touch anyone. God's all powerful and he's able to, to heal the sick. And, and we're going to pray for those things. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 8. As always, there's a lot of subjects to cover here, so I'm just going to try to get through as many of these as I can um, without taking too much time on any one of them. Verse number 11, the Bible says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This just further cements that this centurion was a Gentile. He was not a Jew, and he's marveling at the great faith that he had and ultimately rebuking the Jews that, that are going to be rejecting him. And he's given this warning and explaining. He says, you know what? Many people, 
many people are going to come from the east, from the west, basically from all over. And they're going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. They're going to be in heaven. They're going to sit down with, uh, you know, because what did the Jews, re they revered Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? They're always talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, and that they were children of these, of these forefathers and, and how great that was. He's saying, you know what? These guys are all going to sit down with them. It says, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. And when he says the children of the kingdom, he's not talking about the children of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the kingdom of Israel, the physical, the physical children of the kingdom. Because it was given unto them. But through unbelief, through their rejection, it's taken away. And there could be cast out in the outer darkness as there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I read this, I'm curious how the Zionists would twist this scripture. Especially because one of the ones that they love to quote all the time is in Romans 11 where it says, and so all Israel shall be saved, right? So they say, yeah, but there's going to come a time and all Israel is going to believe on Jesus and they're all going to be saved. Well, Jesus just said the children of the kingdom are going to be cast out in outer darkness. So how can, they, how can they all be spiritually saved if they're going into outer darkness? Obviously, it's not talking about, when well, Romans 11, it's not talking about the physical children. That's why even in Matthew 8, he's making reference to these people sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to these fathers, because the spiritual children are going to be sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because as Galatians 3 states, and many other places states, Romans states, that, you know, not all Israel are of Israel. They're not physically of descended from Israel. It's spiritually. He's Abraham's seed um, because, he's, because he's a believer, because he's put his faith in Jesus Christ. So he is a, a spiritual child. Now, um, but I think this is, this is a great reference to show people, well, Jesus said that the children of the kingdom are cast in outer darkness. So obviously they're not all going to be saved. That's not, not in that sense, not, in physical, not with physical Israel. Let's keep reading here. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 13, the Bible reads, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. So you notice when we looked at Luke 7 and Matthew 8, how there's different aspects. And I think that's, that's also one of the reasons why you'll see certain things left out is because of the flow and what, and what they're trying to express. Matthew chapter 8 focused a lot more on that great faith and then went even further to include Jesus' statement about the children of the kingdom being cast out before finally saying, okay, you know, be it done unto you. Whereas Luke 7 focused more on the centurion and him sending people out and just his great humility and things like that. So the story reads slightly different, even though it's the exact same thing. You just get kind of different perspectives of what's being focused on in each account. But then that's why I say, you know, try to piece everything together, read it together, and then you can get the full story in your mind and, and understand everything, especially when you might not have the right understanding of the way things play out until you get all of it together. As we saw here, you could just, just thought that the centurion was directly speaking to Jesus when the entire time he really wasn't. He had somebody else there, and you don't know that until you put them all together. So uh, let's keep reading here. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 13, or excuse me, for, verse number 14. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And this is another spot where if all you had was the book of Matthew, it's possible to read this and say, well, who is the he, you know, his, his wife? Was it Jesus' wife? Because you have two antecedents there. You've got Peter's house and Jesus being in the subject of that, of that verse. Obviously, it wasn't Jesus if Jesus wasn't married. But when, and when you look at other 
Gospels, like in Mark chapter 1, verse 30, the Bible says, But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. So it's more specific saying it was Simon's wife. Um, it's not that this is, you know, again, Matthew 8, 14. It's not incorrect. It just, it's not quite as clear as, you'd, as you may like it to be, but the other places make it very clear without a doubt. And, um, but one thing I just want to point out here is again, I mean, it just seems like when we just read the New Testament week after week, how many times are the doctrines of the Catholic Church just destroyed? Just on real simple readings of the Scripture. And if you're not familiar with it, one of the doctrines that they hold is that Peter is the first pope. You know, the Catholic Church teaches that there's a pope that, um, you know, and, and in the Catholic Church teaching, they don't rest on the Holy Scripture as their final authority for all matters of faith and practice. They rely on, supposedly rely on the Bible and tradition and what the, what the Pope says as being, uh, you know, the vicar of Christ here on earth. So this is one of those areas where they say Peter is the first Pope. And of course, they teach that popes need to be celibate and that the priests need to be celibate and that they can't be married. They can't have wives. Yet we see here, supposedly, the first pope is married. And it says that his wife's mother laid, laid uh, and sick of a fever. Now, what they'll try to say is that, yeah, well, his wife must have passed away before he became an apostle. <laughs> because why doesn't it mention her? His, I mean, her own daughter would have been right there if she had a fever. It doesn't have to mention her. She had no, no part in the story at all. Her da the daughter didn't didn't heal her. Jesus healed her. And then she rose up. But not only that, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you want to turn there, and you know, I'm bringing this up. I know, look, you guys aren't Catholic. I know that. Some of you maybe used to be Catholic. But the reason why I bring this up is that you may have Catholic friends. Family. Or family. Yes, exactly. Friends, family, and maybe you've tried preaching the gospel to them. And look, the, the gospel is the most important thing. We're not out just trying to argue with Catholics about all their doctrine. But oftentimes, especially with family, you can bring up the gospel and bring up the gospel and bring up the gospel. And after a while, it's, it's, people just don't even want to hear that anymore. But their family or their friends, and you, and you see them regularly. And, you know, I was just talking to someone about this the other day. How do you keep bringing up the gospel about people that you love when they really just don't want to hear the gospel anymore? Well, one of the ways is through other doctrines and just other things. And there's ways that you can bring up fallacies and just, just get people to question. You can do it tactfully. Obviously, you know, when I preach, I do a lot of yelling and hitting the pulpit and doing things like that for teaching within the church. But this is not the way that I deal with some unsaved Catholic when I want to win them over to Christ. I don't just scream and yell and spit and, you know, and, and do all that. Why? Because it's a different setting. It wouldn't be appropriate. When, you, when you're trying to give someone the gospel and teach them the truth out of love, you're going to try to give them the gospel, give them the gospel, give them, okay, they're not receiving it. Well, how about you just try saying, well, what do you think about this, right? Like, if they really just want to hold on to Catholicism, what, what do you think about this when the Bible says that, you know, the, the church is teaching you this, but look at what the Bible says. It's contradictory. So I like bringing these things up for you just to have the information so that way you can say, hey, what, what about this? What about Peter being the Pope? What, what about Peter being married and all these priests? I mean, it's kind of a hot bu button subject anyways with all these Catholic priests being pedophiles. Would, they, would there be as many pedophiles if they at least were able to get married? I don't know. But that's, that's what we have going on. I mean, obviously it's in the news and stuff, but I would say... Anytime that story, like any of those stories comes up, you could just be like, you know, these priests really should be getting married. That's not something that should be forbidden, and it's not something the Bible forbids. 
And you can show them 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You can show them one, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 8, where, where Peter has a wife who's sick and Jesus heals her. Obviously, he was married. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1, the Bible reads, am, not, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Of course, this is the apostle Paul speaking. Verse number 2, If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this, Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? It's not a mistake that God's word, that God specifically wanted Peter's name mentioned when he's referencing other apostles, you know, the, the physical brethren of Jesus Christ. He says, and even Peter. Because as Peter's other name is Cephas, he's saying, don't we have the power as apostles to lead about a sister, and he says a wife. Why is he a sister, a wife? Because you should be marrying someone who's saved. So when you marry someone who's born again as a man, that's your sister in Christ. So you lead about a sister, a wife. Amen. The same person, but that's who you're leading about. And he's saying, don't we have that power? Yes, they do. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. Yes, they have that power as a brother of the Lord and as Cephas. Peter had the power. He was married. We do too, is what he's saying. And this destroys the concept that, oh, you have to be celibate. It's not found in Scripture, my friend. And, and you know, Share these, these truths with the Catholic person that you know. If, you know. First, always start off with the gospel. But then maybe even after the gospel, maybe someone gets saved. I still like trying to show them just a couple things because you want people to understand that like Christianity is different than Catholicism. And people have known this for a really long time in general, but the line's being more blurred now. People used to say a lot more frequently, are you Christian or Catholic? Meaning two completely different things. And that was very common for a very, very long time. And some people will still use that same type of terminology. But these days, because everybody just wants to be known as Christian in general and just blur it all together as just being one huge big thing and that we're all brothers and sisters regardless of, of basically what you even believe about salvation, you're just all Christian, calling Mormons Christian and Jehovah's Witnesses Christian and, and people who just come up with any old Jesus that's not the Jesus of the Bible and just call them Christian too just because they claim the name of Christ. Yeah. It's not true. And people are doing that even with Catholicism. It's not Christianity. It's Catholicism. It's a different religion altogether. And I like to leave people with just a little bit of knowledge so that they understand, you know, especially after they get saved, don't go back to the Catholic Church. They didn't bring you salvation. They're not teaching salvation. They're teaching works. They're not teaching grace. They're not teaching the free gift. There is no reason to go back to that. It's no good. They're ju you're just going to hear a bunch of lies by people who don't understand the Bible because the natural man receiveth not the things of God. They can't understand. The Bible's spiritually discerned. And they're not going to be able to get that. That's why they're not able to teach it. And that's why they don't even understand the most basic things that we can see written in Scripture. Hey, don't, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. And then he gives us a sample prayer. And then what do they do? They make vain repetitions out of the prayer right after Jesus said, don't make vain repetitions. That's how blind they are. But it just goes to show that they're completely unsaved. Right. Just don't even understand the Bible at all. Point that out. I mean, people need to hear that. That it's, that it's not just another branch of Christianity. Oh, well, there's a few different doctrines, some things. No, look, it's, it's not even Christian. It's not even Christian. 
and you know, with these people, you can use it with other Catholic family members. Use it as a way to 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 bring up Bible things, and and show them that, and and make sure you know the Scripture. You know it, so you can you can show them and teach them. Let's keep reading here in Matthew chapter eight, look at verse number fifteen. The Bible says, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now this is a quote, as I've been trying to do in, in all of the, the chapters so far, I'll give you the quote or the reference where that comes from. This comes from Isaiah 53, verse number 4, where the Bible reads, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So this verse is coming to pass here, according to the scripture, in Matthew chapter 8, as he's healing people, as he's healing people who are possessed, as he's healing people um, that were sick. Now, you might wonder, well, why does it say in the New Testament that he was, he took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, but in Isaiah it says he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. It's basically the same thing. I mean, it is. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, you would have a problem, but they are the same thing. You think about when you're, when you're sick and you have these infirmities, they are more specific of, of the griefs and the sorrows that he's bearing. So, He's fulfilling the scripture by doing these things because the people who have these sicknesses and are possessed of devils, it's not, even being possessed with devils, it's not necessarily a sickness, but they are bearing griefs and sorrows that Jesus is healing them of. And he's bearing them and, uh, and taking them from him. So this is just something that was projected in Isaiah chapter 53 of the Savior, which he fulfilled in Matthew chapter 8. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. So he's saying, you know, this scribe comes up to him and says, Hey, I want to go everywhere you go. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to follow you. And Jesus answered him. It says, Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So what he's, what he's explaining to him, he's not saying you can't follow me, but he's warning him and he's saying, Consider the cost. You say you want to follow me. He's saying, hey, the foxes, they've got dens. The birds, they've got the Everyone, every animal, every creature has, has a place to go. They've got a home to go to, is what he's telling them. But I don't even know where I'm going to lay my head tonight. I don't know where I'm going to sleep. I don't have a place. I'm going about and preaching, and, and you want to follow me? Here's what you're signing up for. It's not a life of comfort, is what he's explaining to them. And I think there's too many people today that will claim to be followers of Jesus. I'm following Jesus. You ask me, what do you have to do to be saved? Well, you've got to follow Jesus. As they live some of the most comfortable lives known to man. I don't think you're following Jesus. If your life is that comfortable, if you don't have persecution, if you don't have anything, that is not the way Jesus led his life. Just like people saying, well, I love Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. Oh, we don't need to worry about the law in the New Testament. That's Jesus Christ saying that in the New Testament. If you love me, keep my commandments. Follow Jesus. This is what we saw earlier. You know, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Are you following Jesus? Not if you're not a fisher of men. Are you following Jesus? Hey, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. That's not comfortable. The verse number 21, the Bible says, And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Following Jesus is a, is a serious thing. 
He said, I don't want you half-hearted. I don't want you just going along because it just seems a little exciting. So I want you in this. Are you with me or not? If you're with me, then come with me and just be prepared. Because who knows where we're sleeping tonight? But you come with me. But don't, but don't look back. Don't worry about it. Look, you got to go. Just like his, the reason why the, the apostles were, were chosen by Jesus Christ as they were, because when he chose Peter and James and John, you know what they did? They left their nets. I mean, they were at work, and Jesus said, follow me, and they dropped everything. James and John left their dad in the boat. Peter left his wife at home and went and followed Jesus. These men, when Jesus said, come, follow me, they dropped whatever it was in their life that was going on, and they followed Jesus. And that's why they were chosen, because they had that spirit about them. They had that attitude that was just like, yes, I will follow you, Lord. And they did. And even when the multitudes, right now, it's, Jesus is popular. He's got multitudes following him. But guess what? It's not going to be that much longer before the multitudes are all going to dissipate. They're all going to go away. Jesus is going to say something that they're offended by, and then all of a sudden, yeah, I don't know about this guy anymore, and they all leave. But his disciples don't leave. They're right there. They're the ones truly following Jesus. See, many people might try to follow Jesus for a short period of time. They'll, okay, we'll try it out. We'll have some fun. But then as soon as something, you know, hard times come or, or things get a little bit rough, people get thrown into prison. Now all of a sudden, whoa, okay, hold on a minute there. That's not for me. And people just fall out. Do you truly want to be a follower of Christ? Have it settled in your heart. Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. That's what Jesus said. Look at verse number 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. So it was there, right there, his disciples followed him. It doesn't say these other guys followed him. It says when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. But I thought that if you're following Jesus, everything's going to go well for you. They just get into this boat. They're following Jesus. They get in this boat, and they're in the middle of a storm. Waves and lightning, and, you know, it's crashing down, and they're feared. They're afraid. They're fearful. They're, they're afraid for their lives. That's how bad the storm is. And don't forget that some of these guys were fishermen. They know what it's like to be on the sea. They know what it's like to go through storms. Yet here they are, afraid. You know what that tells me? It's a pretty serious storm. And it's also pretty cool then because Jesus was asleep <laughs> in the midst of the storm. He had no reason to be afraid because Jesus had all faith. He didn't need to, you know, to worry about anything. He knew his hour wasn't come. He knew the work he had to do. Okay, it's a storm. <laughs> what are you guys freaking out about? But, but then another thing that's cool about, about Jesus, so it looked like it says, he was asleep. His disciples came to him, verse 25, and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And just as we'll see in every instance of people coming to Jesus, asking for salvation, asking to be saved, he does it. He may say something like he does here, but he does it. He saves them. You think of Peter when he gets out of the boat and the waves are coming, he starts to sink. Lord, save me. Immediately grabs him by the hand, pulls him up. Verse 26, and he saith unto them, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? She said, why are you guys afraid? He's kind of disappointed. Why are you so afraid? You're with me. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and sea, and there was a great calm. So what did he do? He saved them. He said, okay, why are you afraid? But for their sakes, he still shows grace and comfort and mercy, and, and he calms the storm. He said, okay, well, I'll take care of this for you. And then it says in verse 27, but the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Yeah, what manner of man is this? I'll tell you what manner. The Son of God. 
This isn't, this isn't just a prophet. This isn't just another in a line of prophets that were given the word of God to preach and they did some good things and there were, yeah, a few miracles maybe done by their hands. No, this is the Son of God. Jesus did things that no one has ever done before. Jesus proved he was the Son of God beyond any shadow of a doubt through all of the healings, through all of the miracles, through everything he did. You could say, yeah, you know what? Moses was able to do a few things through the power of God with the plagues in Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. Elisha was able to do a few things. Elijah was able to do a few things. There's a few men throughout history that, have, that, have, that God has given some power to do some things and to heal some people, but nothing at all pales in comparison to Jesus Christ with just the sheer volume of miracles that he was doing and just what he was doing. I mean, there's this great storm that has fishermen afraid, career fishermen afraid, and Jesus comes out and just... Just immediately, it's calm. How amazing is that? And we'll get to this much later, but I feel like it's good to just bring this up kind of regularly. This is why, you know, because you, you could, it could boggle your mind thinking, well, how could the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers just have been so hardened and rejected him when He's doing all these things. I mean, this was public. He's not doing it. Okay, on the boat, only the people on the boat saw that. But he's casting out devils and doing all these other healings in public. I mean, people were coming to him. The centurion knew about it, and he was seeking to have, him, to have people healed. This was public knowledge. He had multitudes following him, and he was healing and casting out spirits all the time. All the time. This is, this is not some, you know, scattered event. And what that should do, if you were just to think about being around during that time, how could any normal person say that's not of God? He's actually doing that through the devil. But that's what the Pharisees did. That's what, by and large, ultimately the Jews did. Not all of them. There was a remnant. There were people that believed, of course. And we read about those people, and some of them were his disciples. But as a whole, rejected. That gives you a glimpse just into how obstinate their heart was. What else could you ask for? I mean, we're asking people to believe on Jesus today without having seen any of these things, you just got to trust what's written in the book. They were able to see some of these things being done and they still didn't believe. And that's why um, when, you, when you read in Luke 16 the story of, of Lazarus and the rich man, right? Lazarus the beggar and the rich man and the rich man's pleading with Abraham saying, hey, you know, send him back to my family. You know, they'll believe if one, you know, if he comes back, they'll believe then. And he says, you know, they have, he has Moses and the prophets. You know, let him, let him hear them. And, and, you know, they won't believe even though someone comes back from the dead. Right. And that's obviously a reference to Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, yet people still just, just refuse to believe. So even sending him back, he's like, that's, if they're not going to believe, if they're not going to believe Moses and the prophets, if he's not going to hear the word of God, then it doesn't even matter if they see someone come back from the dead. Let's keep reading here. Um, verse number 28. This is kind of the last story for this chapter. Matthew 8, 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, 
the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Flip over to Mark chapter 5 because we're going to look at a little bit more detail uh, from this story in the book of Mark. And there's a couple of things I want to point out. In Mark chapter 5, though, so in Matthew chapter 8, we see that there was two men possessed with devils. Mark 5 only talks about one of those men. But we get some more detail just about him and about what they're doing. We see these guys, they're possessed with devils. And yes, being possessed of devils is a real thing. Amen. It's not just something you see in the movies. And it's not something that only was around back then. Amen. We can look at the attributes. You could go through, the, this is kind of a whole study in itself. Uh, but... When you read through, especially in the book of Mark, the book of Mark has more stories about people being possessed with devils than any other book. You can read through that and just kind of see. But this story itself has a lot of clues. When you see people doing these things, that's a sign that they're possessed with devils. And we live in a world where people will try to diagnose and give a clinical term, a medical term to being possessed with devils, but it doesn't mean that that means they're not possessed. Right. So how about multiple personality disorder? Yep. They'll say, well, this person has multiple personality disorder because when they speak, they could literally talk like they're, they're two different people inside of them. Yep. Oh, that, but that can't happen. These people are just confused. They've dissociated their mind into now thinking that they have two people. You know, they're possessed. The reason why they have these multiple personalities is because there's multiple personalities living within them. They're called devils. And this is what the Word of God says. So I don't care what your psycho babble textbook says. I'm going to believe the Word of God. And when the Word of God talks about people being possessed with devils, I believe it. It's one of the miracles that Jesus was doing, proving he was the Son of God, casting out devils. Do you believe Jesus was casting out devils or not? Because I believe he was doing it. When Jesus was having this conversation with these people, when they arrived and these men that were possessed with devils came out, what were they saying? He says, Behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They knew that Jesus is the Son of God. This isn't the man speaking. These are the devils speaking from within the men. And we'll see more of that in Mark chapter 5 because there's a longer conversation that we see going on here. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So one of the things we see here is that these guys, they're living in like a graveyard. They like death. Okay, they're all about death, the grave, the dark stuff. Okay, this is what they're living around. A very morbid type of life. It says that no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So he had a lot of strength, but not just a lot of strength. I think this also shows that they're unruly. No respect for authority, no respect for government, no respect for anything. Just, I'm going to do what I want to do. Just like the satanic Bible says, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Right. That, that wicked book by, uh, I think it's Alistair Crawley, that that's, that's what the satanic Bible is all about. Do what you want to do. That's your law. Well, these people couldn't be bound. You can't bind them. You can't give them un any rules or any laws. And it says that in Mark chapter 8, that no man might pass by that way. Right? I mean, these are mean people. They're not letting anyone go by because they're attacking them or whatever. 
and, and people just want to stay away from them. So these are all attributes that we're seeing here uh, with these people who are possessed with devils. Look at verse number four. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Think about some of the homeless people that you've seen having conversations with nobody, talking. And when it says crying, that's not referring, again, it's not referring to weeping, like shedding tears. It's just cry, just yelling. Right. Yeah. Just out in the mountains, out in the tombs, just, just yelling and, and cutting himself with stones. Just... There are people out there that do these very same things today. And if we're going to look at what these people possessed did, I don't think it's a far cry to say, you know what? These people who exhibit all the same behavior, they're possessed with devils too. It says in verse number six, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. So he's talking to this man. And this man says, Well, we are Legion. We're many. Talk about a multiple personality disorder. <laughs> this guy had a Legion inside of him. But they're devils. It's not this, not this guy. That, that he's clearly talking to devils. They're talking to Jesus. This, is, this guy is not in his right man, mind. That's why he's possessed. Because they've taken possession of his body and are controlling him and speaking for him and everything else. That guy is not in the driver's seat. It's important to point that out. Because what we see then with the rest of this story, Jesus casts them out, right? There are people that were watching over this herd of swine. The legion of devils go out into the swine and they run violently down this hill into the ocean and, and just die, right? I mean, they just, just basically kind of go and commit suicide. There's a lot of value to a whole herd of swine. And these guys keeping them, they see everything that happens. And they, I'm sure they're probably freaked out like, whoa, what, did this, what just happened? They run into the city and they tell everyone there what happened. So the people of the city come out then to meet Jesus and to see what happens. They come out and it says here, we're going to skip through in, in Mark through all the, the, the swine. And it says... Uh, in verse 15, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. So they come out and they, they see this. Everyone in town knew these guys, right? I mean, no one would pass by that way. They're out just being nuts and crazy and cutting themselves. And here he is now, just a normal guy. He's clothed. He's sitting there. You can have a conversation with the guy. Incredible miracle, evident by everybody that was there. No denying this. It says, and they were afraid, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. Why would you want to send Jesus away? You saw the healing power that he had over these guys that were just wreaking havoc, causing all kinds of problems. But you know what that tells me? They cared more. I think they got comfortable in the life that they had and were probably just irritated that now they lost all those swine just for these guys. Just for these guys that everybody had already written off as being nuts and nobody cared about these guys at all. They obviously didn't care about them because they're just willing to just send Jesus away that just healed these guys instead of rejoicing going, wow, this is amazing. You guys are healed. Praise God. But my last point, these people that have been rejected by everybody else, 
Jesus healed them. Jesus was able to heal them. He didn't give up on them. They were possessed. They were being controlled. I'm sure they, they said and did a lot of bad things. Because I think they were despised by everybody in the town. But they, even they, weren't beyond redemption. Now I bring this up because we, I do believe in a reprobate doctrine that there are people who can become rejected and will never put their faith in Jesus Christ because they have already become a child of the devil. Different sermon for a different day, but I want to bring this up in light of that, that we always still ought to be careful without just throwing around this term of reprobate, just willy-nilly or just, just ill-advised, because we see these guys here. They're possessed of, the, I mean, all this stuff that we read, they were still able to get healed. Everyone else had given up on him. Jesus didn't give up on him. And I think we need to have, overall, that ought to be the spirit that we have. Yes, we recognize we're not going to cast our pearl before swine. I just preached on that last week in Matthew chapter 7. But at the same time, you know, let's, let's not be so quick. One, too quick to judge. Judge righteous judgment, but don't be too quick to judge. And two, man, let's have a heart for people. Jesus had a heart for people. He really did. Even these people that nobody loved. He healed them. Don't ever forget how, how awesome the, the saving power of Jesus Christ is. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your healing, your healing power. God, I pray that you would please just help us. Um, help us as we try to follow you. Lord, I, I'm, I'm sure we all are, are, fall short. But I pray that you would strengthen us and increase our faith and help us to understand that it's not just about being comfortable in this life, but that we want to, uh, if we truly do want to serve you, that we're going to have to put ourselves out there and we're going to have to um, be, be put in situations that are not very comfortable. And um, Lord, I pray that you would just guide us and lead us and instruct us, give us wisdom. And um, Lord, help us to, to reach people even people whom uh, maybe many people in the society are just, just don't want to deal with. Lord, help us to have the heart that, that you have. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.